Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 1145 session. Uh, my name is James Galapagos-Clag with College of the Canyons in California. And it's my pleasure to uh, convene, facilitate, host this session. Um, just to uh, make sure we're all in the right place, this is the 1145 session uh, entitled Cape Town Declaration, Envisioning the Next Decade of Open Education with Nicole Allen and Alec Tarkovsky. Um, just a couple of organizational points. Uh, some of you looking in the hard copy schedule might be expecting two sessions or two topics uh, during this time frame. That's not the case anymore. Uh, Paul Stacy's session will be taking place tomorrow afternoon, I believe. Uh, so at 2.45, thanks, Nicole. In so in a different room. So you don't need to stay here until tomorrow at 2.45. Um, so if you're looking for that session, please check the online schedule. Um, also, uh, this session is being live streamed as well as recorded, so please keep that in mind if you're going to make any comments or at, do Q&A, just keep in mind that it will be recorded and is being streamed. Uh, on that note as well, please do use the microphone when you're asking questions or making comments. It will help with the recording and live streaming uh, for the audience as well as people here in the room who might uh, need, the, need the mic for accessibility purposes. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Nicole and Alec. Thanks. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session about the future of open education and discussions that we can have on this topic. Uh, before we go into session, I just wanted to mention that we uh, wanted to have the session quite interactive. Uh, the format of the room doesn't make that easy. We did our best to come up with some ways of getting you into conversations, though obviously we will not have the kind of conversations you could have, for instance, in a banquet, banquet, banquet setting. <laughs> Uh, having said that, um, we don't mind that you're spread out around the room. One thing that will be useful for you is to be relatively close to another person because we'll have several conversations that should work between two or three people sitting next to each other. So uh, if you want to participate in this interactive part, um, you might want to move at this moment just a bit. Or once we start the, extra, the interactive part. Anything else we should mention? No, I don't think so. So uh, at this conference last year, we held the first of a series of workshops on the Cape Town Declaration 10-year anniversary. So this process was started uh, last year, uh, or two years ago, actually, in 2017, when uh, a group of open education ad advocates and some of the foundations that convened the first uh, Cape Town Declaration convening uh, realized that the 10-year anniversary was coming up and it was time to sort of take a look back at, at the Cape Town Declaration and uh, look ahead to the next decade. And those of you who aren't familiar with the Cape Town Declaration, it was uh, sort of one of the foundational documents articulating a vision of the open education movement for the next decade. Uh, it was released in early 2008 following a convening in Cape Town during the fall of 2007. Uh, with, a, with a group of leaders in the movement who drafted the declaration. And with a number of declarations in the open movement, like the Budapest Open Access Initiative, uh, when anniversaries came around, sometimes uh, the, when we looked back, it was time to write sort of a new vision or a new version or, or a new uh, like add-on declaration. But the group that convened in 2007 to have this conversation in Cape Town uh, during the Open Education Global Conference uh, really recognized that the Cape Town Declaration as it was set out a vision that was still highly relevant today. So what we ended up doing, uh, the group of uh, people who are there, is deciding on uh, setting up the conversation in terms of new directions for the open education movement to recognize that 10 years later, the vision is still the same, but the uh, specifics of how the movement is evolving and the ways that it's, that it's going forward uh, are varied and new. So this is the list of uh, 10 directions that came out of that process. 
And as I mentioned, uh, Alec and myself and, and others who were involved in this have been holding workshops at various open education conferences over the last year. Our first one was here uh, last year, and it was a great sort of critical discussion looking at these directions and thinking about you know, what's missing and, and how do we think about the future of open education. And what we're going to do is structure this workshop into sort of two parts. So one is we're going to take a look at these and have some, some small group conversations uh, about what's here, how it applies in your context, and maybe what's missing. And then the second part, we're going to talk about next steps in terms of this process and whether we do need you know, a larger movement-wide conversation about the future of open education and collective strategies and how we can facilitate those conversations. So before we move into that, we do want to sort of run through what each of these directions are and just say a little bit about them. Uh, and then uh, we can move into some of the discussion questions. So there are 10 of them. Uh, Alec and I are going to alternate. <laughs> um, so uh, the first one is communicating open. And this recognizes that one of the challenges that we often face is how to make people who aren't already engaged in open education or the broader open movement really understand what openness means. There's so many ways it can be confused with free uh, or digital or other related terms and sometimes even now more nefariously conflated by special interests uh, who, who want to uh, go against the open movement. So how do we better communicate open to new audiences? Uh, and the second is empowering the next generation, recognizing that students and early career professionals are the ones that are going to be the, the leaders of the movement uh, tomorrow. And how do we bring them into the open movement? So from the very start, is they're forming their sort of practices and uh, future career paths that, that open is, is baked into that from the start. So Alec, this is you. Um, connecting with... Uh other open movements uh, tries to acknowledge this idea that in the end there is a broader open movement. So probably for some of you, the open education, you come to open education with a focus on education um, and you might not be working with any connections. I know that for many people in the open education movement, connections with let's say open access are important or people work on open data. But there are also some people, I for instance, ultimately I think I approach the open education from the open part and for me these connections are very important. So this direction acknowledges the fact that there's a lot to be gained by um, interconnecting these movements. Um, and the, the fourth direction is probably quite obvious. We called it open pedagogy. Some people speak about open educational practices. I think it acknowledges this big shift that has been happening around the conversation on open education, uh, this move away from a focus on resources. And by the way, the interesting thing that uh, it's worth to be aware of is that the original declaration, which I think often is remembered as a foundation for a, for a resource-based movement actually had a very strong component that talked about uh, in people, teachers, learners, their capacities, their practices, so uh, exactly this direction. Uh, open education for development, recognizing that open education can play a role in supporting economic development and that there are specific uh, ways in which openness uh, exists in developing contexts and helping to understand ways that we can create participatory dialogues uh, uh, with developing contexts around openness and understanding what openness means in, in those places and thinking about how to connect it to the larger sustainable development goals and, and development conversations that are happening in international uh, spaces. Uh, beyond the textbook, thinking about how do we uh, uh, go beyond focusing on the textbook as the main sort of currency of the resources that we use. Uh, and you know, even more broadly, moving beyond a, a focus on open educational resources and thinking more about practices, as Alex said. Okay, this is the moment where you can see that the directions, that the ten directions go in varied directions and not necessarily follow one path, mm -hmm. because in a way, 
this contradicts the previous direction. It's an acknowledgement that in the end this is still a, a fundamental work that's being done by a lot of people in this movement. Uh, we can say that this is, uh, a lot of people will say this is now about pedagogies, but still a lot will work on policies that mm -hmm. uh, open up publicly funded resources in the US, the core work happening. Mm -hmm. is around this issue. In Poland, where I come from, this has been our great uh, high-level, top-down sort of success, so we acknowledge that this work is still happening. Is that the last? No, it's not yet the last one. Um, this one might, might feel like an outlier, and I think it's, it's in a way maybe a, one of the stranger sort of directions that were listed here. It's an attempt to connect um, open education work, which is uh, sort of based on voluntary approaches to open with an acknowledgement that, that our space is also shaped by law uh, and that there are often ongoing copyright reform processes. You might, if you're from Europe, you've probably heard about the big copyright debate, which is probably the regulatory debate on technology in Europe this year, but copyright reform process uh, is happening right now also in South Africa, in Australia, in Can Can Canada. <laughs> in different stages. So this was a direction that said we should be paying attention to these uh, regulatory issues as well. And then the last two, uh, data and analytics is a key area, and I think even since this was raised is, is one of the parts of the, the conversation two years ago. The world has changed uh, with you know Cambridge Analytica and data just meeting new things in our institutions. Uh, and you know data and analytics can be used for good but they can also be exploited and, and misused in ways that are actually really dangerous for students and institutions. So uh, this is a key area that I, I think has become even more significant over the past couple of years. Uh, and then finally, thinking outside the institution, thinking about open education as a way to expand access to educational opportunities beyond traditional schools and universities in addition to the ways that we talk about it as an enabling strategy within our existing institutions. So those are the 10 directions. Uh, we want to transition now into the discussion portion of this conversation where we're going to, we have uh, three rounds of questions. I think we're going to maybe take three minutes, uh, grab a uh, person next to you, groups of twos or threes, and respond to a series of questions. And then uh, share back out any interesting uh, points that are raised in the conversation you have with your partner or partners. More than three minutes? Okay. Maybe five minutes. Okay. Uh, so the first question is just uh, uh, find one or two other people, introduce yourself, and pick one of the directions on this list and say something about how it applies in your context. So that can be a project you're working on, why you think it's important. Uh, or you know any uh, any other uh, way that you think one of these directions is relevant to where you live and work. Like, oh, questions before we start. Um, and then for the people listening into the live stream, uh, just a note that we do have a bitly here to a uh, Google Doc where you can enter your comments, and we'll be watching it and can read it out to the group here. And there's also a YouTube chat you can use to talk with each other. We unfortunately will not be there because like all good television hosts, we got our hosting to do. <laughs> Stay tuned for our next season. <laughs> Um, you need to focus. Okay, if you can hear me, please clap once. If you can hear me, please clap twice. Okay, thanks. Uh, all right, so that's off. Uh, we are going to transition to sharing back any reflections or, or thoughts about uh, what you discussed with your partner, uh, with the whole group. We had an interesting discussion about the meaning of openness and how that's shifted over time. Uh, okay, so raise your hand if you'd like to share back. There's like a tentative, oh. You can't raise somebody else's hand. <laughs> so way up in the back, and then here. I just had a, a rant there about open publishing. As I said, I, I've been 
doing research in about for a year and a half and I'm an editor of an open source journal and uh, as I said, what other job would I actually get a bricklayer in and then the bricklayer has to pay me to let him work on me. We get people to write. So the whole copyright and access and one thing I sort of started to learn was copyright doesn't really mean an awful lot. It's actually the licensing and I think there's an awful lot of us we're so caught up and we we're just talking there about like uh, Cathy's the keynote speaker saying we're, we're so desperate for tenure and promotion and funding so we have to publish in the tier one journals that is read by three men and his dog and then that publisher then charges my own university for my students to access that paper rant over Hi, um, we were talking about uh, connecting with other open movements uh, and I could think of um, open hardware and open software uh, and we were talking about open science but I'm curious to know what other open movements there might be uh, that you're talking about connecting with. Well first of all does anybody in the audience talk about this and want to share? Okay. I think um the most obvious connections are with open access because a lot of the work is done in higher education institutions and we even had a meeting yesterday where we felt a strategy for uh, promoting institutional policies or approaches to open education could be to piggyback on work already successful work with open access more broadly open science uh, open data understood both as open research data and more broadly for instance government data mm -hmm. it can be an educational resource then, um, for instance, in the Wikimedia movement, a lot of people look at connections between education uh, resources and cultural heritage resources and, and work done by cultural heritage institutions. Um, and, and it's good that you mentioned open source and open software because I actually think it's not discussed enough. I'm happy there are talks today uh, and tomorrow about this, but this connection is, is not made enough. But maybe someone feels like something's missing in that list. Do you, do you I would know? add open government to the list. Yes. OK. So um, you were up. I'm sure. Okay. How many uh, young people can uh, So we talked a, a little bit about both data and analytics in the opening up uh, publicly funded resources and how they're kind of tied together, right? So we're a publicly funded, we're at CUNY, we're a publicly funded um, uh, initiative. And so a lot of that requires data to report back, right? And so, you know, I think we're a little, as, a, as an institution, also sort of a little leery about uh, learning analytics um, and what that, what its relationship to open pedagogy really is. Like if we're boxing everything into platforms that are doing, that are running data and, you know, building sort of these proprietary frameworks about how to do adaptive learning, is that really an open pedagogical strategy? Um, but also, you know, we're very, also very, try to be very clear about what kind of data are we actually, you know, collecting on students who are in these platforms. Um, just because you have the data, is it something that you should be using uh, and sharing um, in a lot of ways? Um, and then sort of what kind of stories and what's your approach to open data? I'm by training a social scientist, so you know the the way we approach data uh, is about storytelling, right? And so there's a lot of different stories you can tell. Like if your data says something not necessarily positive about what your OER initiative is or what OER really is, is is that something that you want to share out to getting your open opening up publicly funded resources, right? And so there's a lot of questions I think that we have about this that haven't really been worked out. Yeah, we were not really discussing it because we're introducing our universities to each other, but some uh, one topic I, I always find sort of slips along the way is the topic of accessibility, which can close up a lot of things. Um, and we, I just looked at this textbook framework that was presented um, in the other building. And when I hear that they have this really, really great uh, offer there to create your own textbooks, um, but for the accessibility, there's a checklist and they hope that people follow it. I think that is closing too many doors. Um, yeah, 
I think that's actually missing with a lot of things. And of course, the open source topic is the next issue, sort of, if we don't look at accessibility and open source, it's not really open. It's open to those who have the budget to buy the license, and it's open to those who have command of the senses that are preferred uh, by that media. I mean, the next thing that's coming is augmented reality. How are we going to deal with that with accessibility? I think it's important because then only then we can roll it out. I remember a few years back, open was the thing to, to provide education to the world. And actually it isn't because it's uh, still providing <laughs> to those who have the, the perfect bandwidth and I'm, I'm talking about anywhere in the world. The west of Ireland, a little while ago, was not too great with bandwidth. I don't know how it's like now. So I'm not talking necessarily only outside Europe. So I think that's a big topic for, for open, that we look a little bit at how open is it really, or is it just free? Good. So, so one more comment. I, I really appreciate the uh, sort of cr critical observations or critical questions. In, we had sort of a meta question about this list, very, very helpful list, but it, this sort of sparked our questioning about, you know, who was in the room, who wasn't in the room, whose voices were there, whose voices weren't there, you know, it's a helpful list, but why this list? Yep, so those are important questions that actually provide, oh, it's not. Okay, Th that's a really important question and uh, uh, is a great transition to move into the next section. Uh, where we'll be talking about looking at this list and what is missing uh, and whose voices are missing from the conversation. So thank you for that. Uh, the, the voices are the next third step, oh, right? Oh, sorry. So let's this round two. Now yeah. we do two. So, uh, <laughs> so totally agree. I, I think, you know, with anything like this, if you look at the list of uh, signatories on the original Cape Town Declaration, like, you know, you can see how uh, some decisions are made by smaller groups of people and, um, you know, as with anything that's going to happen, there was a consultative process around this, but I think as we're talking about next steps in this, in this project, making sure that the process is inclusive and globally representative is really, really important. In fact, it, it's existential for, for the process. Okay, so round two, we're gonna go back into groups. Uh, the question is, looking at this list, what direction would you add? Or uh, another way to phrase that is what is missing? Uh, feel free to interpret the question that way as well. Yes. So five-ish minutes. Okay, everyone, if you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap twice. Apparently, it rarely goes to three claps. By then, it means the room is really rowdy. Okay, back to you. Uh, yes. Uh, all right, so who would like to share what you discussed? What direction did you pick? All right, straight in the back, then here. This time will be very quick. We had a discussion and we said open technology, open educational technology should be added because then we have covered what I just mentioned, that people, no matter where, uh, can actually adapt and work with it, and we can also make sure the accessibility is given. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Would you remove anything? Okay. Um, hi. We had a discussion about mindset, having a mindset for openness, and it, it interconnects with some of the points up there, but we, we thought that it was important enough to have its own bullet point because of the struggles that we're, we're having in our institutions, convincing people that open is important, open, you know, sharing open resources, open practices, and the lack of a mindset to be open that exists in our institutions. So openness, uh, mindset for openness. 
And that's different than communicating open, because it's not just about helping them understand what it is, it's making them care. So culture change might be another term. So here, and or there, and then here. Um, yeah, we discussed, um, we actually kind of went, I don't know, this be kind of meta or institutional, and thinking that we, the time may be ripe for unique for doing this, is you look at all of these things, one of the things that is common in a lot of these things is that they rely on network structures and network behavior and stuff like that. We think we need to add to this open governance of how does all of the, how do all these movements become governed? How do we lead this stuff? Because we need to be careful that we don't replicate what are in effect authoritative hierarchical structures in how we do this. You know, like we're already seeing mainstreaming, for example, in some states, for example, where a state coordinator of open whatever, open textbooks or whatever is being hired. Well, it'd be very easy to begin, oh, well, then they're going to need control. They're going to need direction. And before you know it, we're actually, you know, what we need is networked governance where we bring everyone in and, you know, go beyond just consultative process. Because consultative process is still, there is the authority in charge. They're, they're allowing you to have input. And as one of my colleagues at my, my school says, I'm tired of having input. I want to be at the damn table when the decision's made. Thank you. Yep. All right, so here. And then there. Hi. Um, so our point spoke to uh, some some. <coughs> Some of these, and particularly uh, your point about mindset here, that we encapsulated as reframing the institution. And so there was a real uh, sense here that there was, uh, you know, the kind of environment around universities was uh, so volatile, which was the word we've, we chose at lunchtime, uh, at break time, but um, also a, a real need to think about what is the purpose and the value of the, of the university, given the fact that boundaries can be porous and are porous, and what the, who, who is making the decisions. Um, and where the vision is coming from. And so what there is a real lack of is really good arguments about why to do this that are couched in the terms that will respond to the different people who need to hear these arguments. So going upwards about, you know, whether, you know, what the value is that's been retained in the university if you're giving away some of the content and going downwards, you know, how you can do this without having to go through a massive hump of extra work in order to make some of your content open. So um, a need to kind of understand what the purpose of the organization is and to have arguments ready that speak to different constituent communities. Wonderful. So another one, one more up, up there. Oh, sorry. I have, Alec, can you run the mic up there? <laughs> sorry, I have a bad angle. <laughs> oh, sorry. Here. Is that okay? Go yes, on. go for it. So, so the thing, I, I'm, I'm a big copyright geek, so I was looking at the copyright reform for education, and I think an additional dimension of this is not just reform. Reform is a very difficult process, and there are large, you know, um, well-funded lobbies that are against the sort of reform around anything to do with copyright law. And there is a certain level of uh, latent flexibility within the law, fair dealing, fair use, which I think, uh, and, and the work that, that I'm interested in around copyright literacy, raising awareness of copyright, to know that you can make risk-based decisions, <laughs> which I think people need to be able to make themselves around what they do, and that they are part and parcel of making something open, that you can't always be 100% sure that what you're doing is totally risk-free and that people should, uh, there's a fear around copyright and that that might be a limiting factor in take up uh, and, and creation of, of OER and that that should be more than just the reform of the system but working within the system according to the rules as they stand. So we talked, uh, I think, largely about how a lot of these sort of intersect with the, a word that a lot of us don't really understand what exactly it means, which is sustainability, right? Like, what are we talking about? We're trying to maintain this as a movement, maintain this as, a, as activity. And so one of the things that came up for us was technology, but also uh, is labor, right? You know, I think there's a lot of talk about this that, you know, really kind of revolves around just assuming that people are going to do the work and maybe not get compensated for it, do it at a volunteer level. Um, and so some of this comes in to tenure promotion if we're in, a, uh, in an academic institution. Uh, some of this just really comes about, are we, uh, is sustainability, uh, I think Charlie said, uh, is that funding a precarious position for one year? 
or is it actually embedding it into your institution and valuing that labor uh, as something um, that really builds value for everyone involved? And I, I would just also add sustainability of the long durée as well, so not just you know over the the next you know horizon, but just present more in terms of preservation as well. Okay. Librarians. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, I think we'll probably stop there. Uh, Alec and I had a conversation during the break. One that, that I think is, uh, I think is glaringly missing is any, something about equity uh, and inclusiveness of resources. Um, there's power in, in, in having the words written on the list. Uh, and you know, obviously, those were conversations had in, in deciding on this list, but it fell to sort of let's make sure equity is reflected in all of them, and the write-ups of all of them do reflect equity. Uh, but it's not on the list, and I think it should be, my opinion. Uh, okay, so uh, last group discussion round. I think we'll probably make this one a little bit shorter. Uh, but want to take some time to think about who is missing from the broader open education conversation, uh, who should be included, and you know what are some of the ways that, that we can include those voices. So some of some of these already came out in the answers that you've given so far. But talk a little bit about uh, who's missing. And maybe the other way to frame this question is: if you were designing such a process, if you were told, okay, so we want to collectively define directions. How would you go about, who, who, who would decide? Maybe it's about getting certain groups uh, and getting a certain balance. Maybe it's about the process. Uh, you. Yep. Great. Three-ish minutes. All right, Alec is not going to do the clappy thing. Uh, but please give, give your attention back up to the front. Uh, we have, what, six, seven minutes left. Uh, do a quick share out from this conversation, and then we're going to wrap up with a few words uh, about uh, next steps. So uh, who would like to share your response to this question? All right, Josh. Well, in an old academic tradition, let me answer the question by asking a question. Uh, in a conversation, the question came up, if you're asking who should be involved in the conversation, what's the question you want to ask? And for different applications of different areas, you would have a different community. Mm -hmm. There is, uh, basically, there is no glo real global answer. I think that's a very important observation. It takes work to define the questions and find how to include people in those conversations. And it's not all going to be the same. Here. Uh, sorry, I can't really. Great. OK, thank you. So um, I just thought about examples. And the first one we talked about uh, just a moment ago was including students, because I'm a student. And um, they're oftentimes overlooked. But when you just uh, um, asked your counter question, uh, I thought, um, about another counter question, so um, um, who should be included, then why don't we ask who should not be included? So is there anyone whom we shouldn't include in this conversation? Um, and that was just uh, uh, um, a thought in the blink of an eye just, that I just had. Great. Love it. Be critical. Thank you for that. So one thing we discussed was uh, dissenting voices, people who disagree with openness, surely they need to be part of that conversation and that that conversation may even in fact shape how you consider openness so, so why are the reasons behind taking a proprietary approach to something and understanding in some contexts context that's rational and maybe there's room for both Just doing that to keep him fit. Um, it goes a bit in this direction. We are always talking about academics and trainers and teachers and the students. What about all these people who learn outside uh, institutions, informal learning? 
I remember we had this series of OER camps in Germany, and I op offered a workshop on uh, how to include non-pedagogues. And I had 10 teachers sitting in there who were almost shouting at me, how could I dare to say that someone who has no training was actually allowed to do this? And I think they need to be included because learning is not just formal learning. Thank you. These are all great suggestions. So recognizing that we only have a couple of minutes left, I think we're going to wrap up. Um, noting that this is a Google Doc here, if you had an idea that you didn't share, I, I tried to capture a lot of the ideas. Please feel free to go in there and, and stick notes in uh, and add uh, your name to the list. Uh, we want to wrap up by just sort of sharing some reflections on the workshops that we've held at conferences over the past year. Uh, I think what we've learned is that the 10, ten themes are a useful framework for having these conversations. Uh, you know, they are broadly applicable. They're not perfect, but I think the conversations about what's missing are often the most interesting ones uh, and are important. And we think there is a need for a broader conversation about the future of open education that encourages us to think bigger and think critically and think about how new directions can uh, you know, be applied in, uh, across our communities. So what we're going to do now is think about sort of what's, what are the next steps in this process? Do we need a Cape Town plus 11 plus 12 plus whatever? Uh, and what does that look like? And I think this last question that we discussed is a really important part of that. What voices need to be part of the conversation and how do we structure a conversation that is inclusive and participatory? And so in a way, we feel this discussion has wrapped up a, a certain arc, a certain cycle. We won't be organizing more discussions at the event about the 10 directions for Cape Town Declaration. Um, we're thinking a lot how to move forward and in a way, closing this process is, is a commitment to opening up a new one. And the questions we're asking are sort of structural. So how do we have a better conversation? Um, how do we create a situation where, on one hand, we are able to collectively define, you can call it directions or values or strategy, you name it, that we reach some agreement, but, but we, ne we also feel it's not a small group speaking on behalf of a large community, that we're missing some voices and so on. So this is a conversation we've started between the two of us. If any of you are interested uh, in this discussion or in a sort of improved process of this sort, looking forward, but in a lot more diverse and equitable way, uh, we're inviting you to join us. You can find us here at this event or on the internet. Yes. Yes. You can. Um, Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of the day.